Uh, we're now going to have a fireside uh, chat with Governor and uh, our MD, Mr. Sanjeev Chanda, will be conducting it. So it's over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Governor, once again for that tour de force. Uh, we are really reassured about uh, the fact that in terms of the external sector, despite what's happening in the neighboring countries, India is in a different and a very strong place. Also, I think uh, the areas you covered in terms of what banks need to focus on, I'm sure that will define the agenda for not only this conference, but also uh, for next few years. Uh, a few questions, Governor, first uh, on the monetary environment and then a few other areas that you also touched upon. Uh, so f first again, it, it, it seems to be the case that we may be moving now from an era of great moderation to a time of great uncertainty or even perhaps great volatility. A volatility in terms of commodity prices, supply chains, supply shocks, inflation and interest rates. Inflation targeting has worked very well in the time of great moderation. However, the question is, is it an appropriate framework during great volatility or central banks need to have the advantage of a little more flexible framework? I think the current framework that we have with regard to inflation targeting has worked very well over the years. We positioned this inflation targeting framework in our country uh, in 2016 and uh, the average inflation, CPI inflation till the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic in February of, uh, 20, uh, February of 2020. Till that period from 2016 to the onset of the pandemic, the average CPI, the headline inflation, if I remember correctly, was 3.9%. Now thereafter, we had the huge shock coming from COVID. And because we have flexibility inbuilt into the target, 4% plus minus 2. So the MPC, as you are aware, decided to use that flexibility, to, to use that space to tolerate a slightly higher infl inflation that is higher than 4%. And that it is that flexibility which is built into the inflation targeting framework that allowed the MPC to, you know, allowed the MPC and the Reserve Bank of India to reduce policy rates, to inject huge amount of liquidity and several other measures which were taken by the Reserve Bank to fight the onslaught or the impact that the COVID was producing, not only on the financial sector, but also on the real economy. So the entire framework has worked quite well. And inflation targeting is something which is important at all times. And uh, ultimately, as it is said and as it is well known, the common person, he suffers the most if there is high inflation. And uh, inflation and, uh, you know, without any uh, price stability framework may lead to other kind of consequences which will undermine the, you know, the financial stability of the country. Going forward, unless the central bank is mandated to control inflation and maintain price stability, Unless the central bank, as a follow-up to this mandate, takes steps to adjust the policy rate accordingly from time to time, the negative interest rates will increase. It will act as a big disincentive to savers. It will be a big disincentive for financial savings. And less of financial savings will obviously have an impact on the investment outlook or the entire investment climate of any country. Now, there are other consequences also. So I feel that because we have under, you know, gone through this kind of crisis, the COVID, and now the Europe, you know, the war in uh, uh, Europe, which has again produced a uh, lot of consequences in the real sector, in the real market, in the real economy. I think having an inflation target and trying to achieve that ensures that the aspect of financial stability, not only in India, but world over, is maintained and that is the key to maintaining financial stability and so far as india is concerned the framework has worked well before the pandemic during the pandemic and even now i would say that we are very much in line with the requirements of time in terms of the steps that need to be taken so therefore i feel that it is a you know it is a the framework has worked well and needs to continue and I, my personal opinion, and also I think this is the opinion of all of us in the Reserve Bank, is that let's not shift the goalpost to just uh, suit our convenience because the larger requirement of the economy and the financial sector is to have such a framework. Uh, thank you, Governor. Uh, just uh, 
a connected question. Uh, while almost all central banks have moved to tighten policy almost in a coordinated manner, they are in very different situations. For the ECB, it seems to be all bad choices, either control inflation or confront a potential sovereign debt crisis, while the Fed seems to be better placed, with the underlying dynamism of the US economy likely to remain intact, even if it were to engineer a recession. How would you rate India in this context? Could rate hikes threaten an incipient recovery, or is growth momentum likely to continue to gather pace? despite what is the normalization of interest rates possibly? You see, as the MPC has, uh, you know, as the MPC statement, the minutes of the MPC, the MPC resolution, as it has been clearly stating, and as I, as I have also mentioned it earlier and in my statements, our decisions on rate hikes or decisions relating to liquidity, they always take into consideration the aspect of growth. Now, the mandate says, that is the law says, the mandate says that RBI is responsible to maintain price stability, keeping in mind the objective of growth. So the objective of growth has to be kept in mind at all times. We have now changed the, sequ changed the sequence, meaning in sequence of priorities, currently our focus is on inflation followed by growth. So any decision that we take with regard to liquidity, with regard to uh, the policy rates always takes into consideration the kind of impact it is going to produce on the growth and the revival of economic activity. The, uh, the what you call the high frequency indicators in the first three months of this year and even in July, so far as India is concerned, they are looking very positive and uh, in fact, you know, whether you look at uh, GST collections or you look at e-way bills, there was a slight dip in between, but they have improved. The, um, uh, you know, aggregate demand has also improved. Urban demand is uh, fairly strong. The rural demand is showing now signs of picking up. The demand for, you know, Mahatma Gandhi Narega, the demand for work under Mahatma Gandhi Narega has also moderated. So there are several signs of high frequency indicators or for that matter the sale of uh, passenger vehicles, the sale of tractors. I think all of this is showing, uh, uh, you know, they are showing positive development. So our approach is to deal with the problem of inflation squarely, but keeping in mind the objective of growth. And uh, ultimately, you know, uh, we cannot, uh, I mean, as I have said earlier that our target is and will continue to ensure that we have a soft landing for our economy. We were, we had reached a kind of soft landing till the war broke out, the war in Europe. Then the war has created new challenges. And now there are new complexity of challenges, there are new issues, new problems which have come up, which are not under our control, commodity prices, crude prices, and the impact they're having on us, monetary policy tightening, the, you know, the, their spillover, capital outflows, currency depreciation. We are dealing with all these issues, and our target is, and we are confident, and our endeavor shall be to ensure a soft landing for our economy where inflation is brought down closer to the target of 4% over a period of time. At the same time, the growth sacrifice is not unduly, you know, the growth sacrifice is also within manageable limits. Uh, thank you, Governor. Uh, soft landing, of course, means that it's how monetary policy plays out over a period of time. Uh, so the question I have is, while the short-term trajectory of interest rates is apparent, there still remains some ambiguity as to where we are in the interest rate cycle. Is it an accelerated normalization of rates which then transits into a rate stability or is it a response aimed at anchoring inflationary expectations, managing the external environment? You see, our approach as we have said earlier in the last MPC is, uh, you know, withdrawal of accommodation. The policy rate is still lower than where we were before the pandemic. Before the pandemic, our policy rate was 5.15%. Now the policy rate is 4.9%. In terms of liquidity, we are still below the pre-pandemic level. But 
the liquidity has been brought down substantially over the past uh, several months and we had initiated action already through the V triple R's and through the other measures and uh, so the liquidity has come down but nonetheless it is still higher than where we were at the time of the onset of the pandemic. Of course you have a new challenge and a new issues arising out of the war in Europe. So we are still on the mode of withdrawal of accommodation our objective is to anchor inflation expectations and that is how we are uh, proceeding uh, forward. What was the other part of your question? Yeah. That, uh, so, so whether demand management is also part of it or again because it is largely the temporary factors in terms of the external environment, there is a possibility of retracing the steps that we are taking now. No, our objective as I can say, you know, as I said, let me just summarize withdrawal of accommodation, number one. Number two, taking steps and ensure anchoring of inflation expectations. Number three, through monetary policy action to ensure a balance between demand supply. That is something which we are targeting. So it's not a question of compressing the demand unduly or, you know, it's basically finding a balance. The monetary policy, the rates should ensure that, that there is a balance between demand and supply conditions. Uh, so just a small uh, follow up on the last part what you said governor uh, to the extent that predictability is a desirable goal of communication and a policy tool would a dot plot like the ones provided by the FOMC members be a good idea for the RBI? You see first thing is that uh, FOMC meets uh, once in six months our MPC meets uh, once in uh, two months. The situation today and it's been earlier also is extremely volatile and extremely uncertain. In such uncertain times, giving a dot plot may create unnecessary expectations on either side. It will create expectations which you may or may not be able to fulfill going forward through your actions. Now you look at it on in February first week when we presented the monetary policy nobody even around the 19th or 20th of February nobody expected a war of this magnitude and the impact that it has created nobody expected that to happen so supposing you had given a dot plot kind of thing and you had been very specific that this is how we are going to move that is representing each members thinking then the situation turns totally you know completely undergoes a change so therefore you create unnecessarily you would create expectations which you may or may not be able to meet so therefore in such uncertain and volatile times i think having a dot plot approach is a problem because you have to change your stance every time and communication there should be some amount of consistency i agree the situation is volatile and as they say when facts change i also change my actions but the point is broadly there has to be some kind of consistency in our approach and but that whole uh, you know that what the dot plot is achieving in us I feel will create expectations which you may or may not be able to live and in any case forward guidance is provided through the monetary policy statement that we are making and the thinking of each of the individual members is you know is uh, given out when the minutes are released exactly two weeks after the MPC. So we are already doing it but a dot plot and binding yourself to specific points will not uh, work I feel in the this uh, current times when the situation is so uncertain and volatile uh, thank you governor let me just now touch on a few areas that you have covered in your speech uh, central banks ensure the stability of the financial system by regulating the major entities and activities how much of a challenge is it to deliver on this mandate when important financial activities payments lending quasi lending is migrating to unregulated institutions that is an issue we are dealing with. There are large number of unregulated, unlicensed entities which are, you know, doing various kinds of lending. There are uh, licensed entities also which are entering into activities which they are not supposed to undertake. So we are dealing with these issues and uh, as you know, we have formed a committee. The committee's recommendations we have examined and we will be issuing the relevant guidelines in this, regards, in this regard very shortly. Uh, it has taken more time than we had initially, uh, you know, that, than uh, what we had initially in our mind. But the situation is so complex. You know, we are being very careful and very cautious. You know, 
on the one hand you have to support innovation you have to support something new a new product or a new approach which is coming you have to support that at this other you know that is one aspect on the other hand you have to maintain financial stability and see that undue leverage or risks are not built up so therefore you have to find a very delicate balance and therefore we are dealing with the issue very carefully i would feel in the next few days it would come out i have said this even earlier also that we are expecting it shortly but we have taken more time because the situation you know because the entire uh, you know the uh, the entire dynamics of the whole thing is very complex and we are being very cautious and we are trying our best to take a very balanced call that supports innovation at the same time that also does not in any manner compromise uh, financial stability or leads to uh, over leveraging or creates unnecessary uh, financial risks uh, thank you governor i think you have almost answered my next question i think when you talked about the balanced call but let me ask it anyway uh, rbi itself has recently launched an innovation hub which the governor inaugurated what role do you envisage for the central bank in terms of promotion, promoting innovation and technology is it two fold one is that we have certain thoughts and ideas in our mind especially relating to the payments space and other kind of fintech initiatives as you know we have a regulatory sandbox and already number of uh, products uh, Uh, which were you know part of the regulatory sandbox the trials have been completed and we have said that we are okay with it now it is for those players to take it forward so number one we have certain priorities we feel that there are certain you know areas particularly in payment systems in ensuring uh, you know that uh, without internet or uh, in what best way we can improve the entire payment ecosystem in our country on the other hand there is lot of new innovations new initiatives startups they are all coming up with you know fantastic ideas and new ideas so therefore the innovation hub number 1 will focus on our priority areas number 2 they will also themselves because it's an autonomous board and they have complete uh, freedom uh, to sort of decide the priorities they also suggest ideas to us that rbi should look at this so first is to try and work on those areas second is to work and partner with the private sector initiatives and uh, you know all that is happening in the startup ecosystem and in the innovation ecosystem to work with them and try to sort of provide incubation facilities so that the startup companies or a startup entrepreneur is able to commercialize his product and uh, take it forward uh, the bank of international settlements the bis has set up innovation hubs in multiple places uh, we had the option of uh, uh, trying and getting one of their uh, you know centers in india but we decided to go on our own because if we are on our own we have two advantages number one we have flexibility we can do whatever we want number 2 we can always leverage on what the bis is doing because there is constant dialogue also with the bis innovation hub so therefore that is something uh, which we have launched as a rbi as an rbi institution and uh, already the board is functional and uh, as far as i know i have uh, i have been sort of tracking what all is happening i think the developments are looking very promising uh thank you governor my last uh, question would uh, really cover what you have covered in the last part of your address in terms of banking and banks uh, beyond tomorrow so banks have emerged from the pandemic uh, in reasonable shape what might be the residual concerns of the reserve bank and what are the key enhancements that the rbi might have it on its agenda for next few years no there is a room for a constant improvement during the last 3 uh, years notwithstanding the pandemic the lockdown etc as you know we came out with a new document we came out with certain guidelines for uh, relating to governance in uh, commercial scheduled commercial banks we have come out with a new regulatory architecture for microfinance lending a new regulatory framework for nbfcs a new regulatory framework very recently relating to the urban uh, cooperative banks so constantly we are endeavoring to sort of see that uh, the banks in terms of risk management in terms of governance in terms of uh, you know responding to the changing needs of the time 
the banks are in a position to sort of move forward. But then our intention is not to interfere at all in any commercial activities. The banks and their technology teams, their commercial teams, their uh, risk management teams are sufficiently capable of dealing with all these issues. But as a regulator and supervisor, we have to ensure that overall the financial stability is maintained. Now, there are new challenges coming up with regard to financial stability from time to time. So we have to keep close track of developments in individual banking entities as well as what's happening in the entire ecosystem and then work closely with the banks in partnership with the banks to see that the uh, you know that uh, they re remain robust at all times you will remember that during the pandemic uh, we had i mean uh, with the banks i had uh, regularly we were having interactions those days during the pandemic even during the lockdown we were having this uh, video meetings with uh, both public and private sector banks and one point which we were constantly emphasizing uh, was to raise capital because we knew that going forward there can be a stress to the balance sheet of the banks and i'm very happy to say here that i think almost every bank responded very positively and most of the banks raised capital and today that is how we have the strong uh, the financials and the strong uh, you know we have a strong capital adequacy in the banks so the idea is that uh, to work constantly with the banks with regard to the challenges that we have currently one is this whole digital and this technology uh, space where the banks also need to move in uh, you know in uh, move in uh, uh, in tandem with the requirements of time banks are also facing challenge from new entities so whether we should in try and regulate the new entities or if we decide to regulate how we regulate them so i think basically what remains to be done depends on how the situation evolves and how we read the evolving situation so it's a constant exercise that uh, goes on the challenges of today will be you know will undergo change and the challenges of tomorrow will be completely different the challenges of beyond tomorrow will also be far more different so we have to be in tune with the times uh, thank you, Governor. You have been very kind, very frank and forthright as always. Uh, with your permission, since we have a little bit of time, we might take a few questions from the audience. Governor, you talked about the issue of commodity price inflation. Can, you, is, can you please introduce yourself? Yeah, my, just, name, yeah. my name is Y. Pitalwala. Uh, I represent Business India Magazine. Uh, you talked about the issue of commodity price inflation and uh, uh, the resultant impact which is having, particularly with respect to the war that we are experiencing. Uh, to the extent that uh, the Indian GDP growth as well as exports is also has a very high import intensity, to what extent do you see exchange rate also contributing to this inflationary expectations? Um, because that too uh, will play in terms of how you go about anchoring those inflation expectations and the reality, right? No, naturally when the commodity prices go up, we are major importers of crude oil. And uh, when the price of crude oil uh, per barrel goes up from 80, 85 uh, dollars per barrel, it went up to 120. It, in fact, it touched 130 as you know. Today now it's about 106 or so in the morning I had seen. So naturally, you know, we are paying more for uh, that uh, barrel of uh, crude oil. So when you pay more uh, for importing for two factors, number one, the prices have gone up. Number two, the currencies are facing depreciation. So naturally, that is what is called imported inflation. So our approach also, monetary policy action also looks at the imported component of inflation. In all our assessment, when we make uh, projections, we have given a projection of, for the current year, the 6.7% uh, as the average inflation for the current financial year. We will be reviewing it uh, as a part of the next MPC. Uh, I will not like to comment on that because our research teams are already working on it and we will discuss it during the MPC monetary policy meeting and we will decide. So obviously it is a component which impacts our inflation and our action, monetary policy action will naturally factor that in and it factors that in. You know the price rise 
of uh, commodity prices as well as uh, the further rise due to you know uh, with due to currency depreciation they are definitely important factors imported inflation is a challenge and today as we have said even food inflation you know as uh, we had stated in the last uh, policy meeting now we are surplus in wheat but the wheat prices went up because uh, international prices uh, of wheat uh, went up so therefore that naturally impacts our local inflation so all these factors are analyzed and uh, as a part of our inflation calculation and projections one more question you talked about the issue of negative interest rates and the impact that it will have on uh, savings and investments and therefore growth uh, and you also pointed out that pre covid it is post covid that we've had this to what extent given the volatile situation that you see we continue to to forecast that the Indian economy will have negative real interest rates for savers because historically we've always been a savings intensive economies, particularly when you look at the household sector. No, the savings are picking up with uh, growth of uh, credit. In fact, credit growth has now touched 14%. Our figure, official figures which we have given out, the latest number is about 13.5 or something we have given out. 13.4 or something, but I think internally we are aware that uh, it has already touched 14%. So when there is credit offtake, naturally the liquidity will, uh, you know, there will be a draining out of liquidity. And uh, there is always a leakage uh, of liquidity through currency in circulation going up. So we are also increasing our policy rates. So going forward, the banks who have already started uh, you know, adjusting their uh, asset uh, prices, that is the interest rates they charge on the loans. In the liability side also, some banks have already started increasing the deposit rates. But going forward, when there is a requirement of liquidity, and uh, I think the banks will uh, steadily and slowly increase the deposit rates. And uh, policy rates, basically, when we increase the policy rates, that also impacts on, uh, you know, the deposit rates in the system, in the liability side. There's a transmission time, but eventually it will transmit to deposit rates also. Yeah, yeah uh, 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 sorry, good morning. I am basically uh, uh, finance controller of Vimal Intertrade. Uh, my question is... You are from? Sorry, I didn't uh, get... I am a finance controller from Vimal Intertrade Private Limited. Uh, my question is, uh, recently RBI has uh, uh, decided to allow the settlement of international trade in rupees. So what is the uh, impact of uh, same on overall uh, economy of India? Whether uh, uh, India... India uh, have, will have a dependency on USD or how it will be, how it will affect the Indian economy? No, it's too early to say. It's an additional facility that we have given to the importers and exporters. So far, all the, you know, the import, export and all the international trade so far as India is concerned has been by and large dollar denominated. This is a new facility we have opened up. There was a demand uh, from the industry for quite some time. This idea was under discussion and was under assessment in the Reserve Bank of India and uh, we have been working on this whole idea. So the idea was to give an additional uh, in an additional, a new avenue, a new option to the importers and exporters to do their trade in rupees. It, it is too early to assess its impact, but I think over a period of time it should uh, pick up, but we have to wait and see. It's too early to say how it will shape up in the future, but potential is good. Thank you very much. Sir. Yeah, thank you. Uh, good morning, sir. Marundhati Bhattacharya, CEO you of You need no introduction. <laughs> so, thank you. Uh, sir, uh, first of all, thank you for your very reassuring and erudite speech. It is very reassuring to hear the kind of things that you said from this podium. Uh, what I really wanted to ask is on uh, climate change. You mentioned that as one of those events that are, you know, definitely going to impact us. Uh, India has, on the whole, overall as a country, given a net zero goal for itself, uh, which is way out. 
uh, you control a very large sector of the economy. You are the regulator for the BFSI sector. And the BFSI sector in turn lends to many of the industries that are you know, very far from you know, achieving net zero status. We also know that in India, mandates work best. So do you all as the regulator have in mind any mandate for the BFSI sector to achieve net zero status? You see, in this area, whatever we want to do, we would like to do it in a collaborative manner. And precisely with this objective, we are coming out with a discussion paper on uh, climate uh, change and climate re related risks. The discussion paper should be coming out uh, sometime next week, I would expect. And uh, based on that, you know, it's a discussion paper, so we would like to get suggestions, ideas from all stakeholders. And after getting the ideas and inputs, then we will examine them internally and we will go forward. We'll move forward. You know, so far as the climate change uh, targets are concerned, I think India has done very well. All the goals, all the milestones for India under COP26 have been achieved. Quite a number of developed countries have not done that. But India has achieved all the targets under COP26. I mean, having been a Sherpa for G20, uh, you know, I keep still keep track of what's happening in uh, these areas. So we have achieved all our mandate. And uh, India has a target at net zero, which you have uh, mentioned. We have to move in a very calibrated manner. There is the aspect of not compromising on growth there is not a comp as there is the aspect of not sacrificing too much of growth there is the aspect of looking at the cost at the same time there is the requirement to give due and sufficient priority to climate related risks so a balanced approach as always needs to be taken uh, i would look forward for very valued comments from uh, you know, senior bankers and other stakeholders, academicians and uh, uh, finance and uh, finance professionals and others on our discussion paper. When it comes, we will, uh, uh, you know, we don't want to be too prescriptive without having a proper consultation. Our approach has been consultative. We will consult and then move forward. So the IT industry can definitely contribute hugely. We'll look forward to doing that. Sure, Thank definitely, you. yeah. Good morning, uh, Governor and Sanjeev sir. Uh, my name is Mohit Deegan. I am currently employed with MasterCard, but my question is not from that perspective. I ask you as a question of a student of cybersecurity. I am doing a course on cybersecurity, and I have been reading about the challenges that banks across the world have been facing. As we say with challenges, there are opportunities. So it works the vice versa as well with the opportunities, and especially in digital, uh, the explosion in digital that we've seen over because of COVID and other technology uh, things that banks have adopted. My question to you, Governor, is does cybersecurity threat give you sleepless nights? And if so, what would be your recommendation to banks on the whole? I never have a sleepless night, <laughs> whatever be the situation, because what is happening all around, you cannot control everything, but you have to deal with it. So you have to sleep well so that you go out to do your batting and you bat well. A good night's sleep is very essential for doing very well on the cricket pitch. And since I am a cricket fan, I always use the cricketing uh, you know, analogy. Now, cyber security is a real problem, is a real threat. When the COVID pandemic uh, you know, started, uh, Mr. Chadha would recall, and other senior bankers present here would recall, Around 20th of uh, February that year, in 2020, internally we sort of uh, heightened our cyber, you know, alertness. And we sensitized all the banks, not just by writing a letter to all the banks, but we had interaction with the IT heads of all the banks. We also had a meeting with the CEOs of banks because that was a time where we expected the number of attacks, cyber attacks to go up because the, those, the guys on the other side will think that ki now people are focused on COVID, so this is the best time to attack. So therefore, everybody was sensitized and this is a challenge and uh, uh, this is one area where I think uh, 
you know the IT uh, systems of every bank, every financial institution, including the Reserve Bank of India, we'll have to be uh, one step ahead of the, you know, of the attackers. And uh, you know the kind of uh, cyber attacks or any problem, the threats that may come, and uh, that requires knowledge acquisition. That requires being constantly alert. And uh, people have been talking of ethical hacking. Uh, that is up to institutions to decide because ethical hacking also has its, you know, downsides and risks. But basically the, and I think I touched upon it in my speech also, the idea is to sort of constantly upgrade knowledge, constantly know what is happening all around and keep on investing more in IT systems and uh, internal uh, skills of uh, banks and financial institutions. Because in days to come, it is going to, you know, the prob as a problem, it's going to become bigger and bigger. And uh, we have to be very alert uh, to deal with it. We just cannot afford, uh, you know, compromising our financial system and the huge data that we carry in any manner. Good morning, Governor. This is Dipanvita Mazumdar from Bank of Baroda. I would like to ask you one question. Uh, the system level liquidity uh, has gone down and liquidity normalization has happened, but durable liquidity is still at an elevated level. And going forward in the second half when currency demand picks up and RBI's FX intervention pans out. So how would that impact the level of liquidity and what will be the impact on rates? Thank you so much. Impact on rates, I cannot say. You will have to wait for the Monetary Policy Committee meetings. Uh, the rates will depend on the evolving, uh, as I have always said, the rates will depend on the evolving uh, inflation growth uh, dynamics. So far as liquidity is concerned, today, you know, if you put together the variable, and these are not any secret figures, it's known to everybody. I think the V triple R. Uh, 14 days and the VRR 28 days and uh, the daily you know the liqu liquidity which comes back to us through the SDF that works out to about 2.8 lakh crores 2.9 lakh crores or so uh, that was yesterday's figure and uh, there is a government cash balance also so put together we have about uh, 5 to 6 lakh crore of liquidity in the system so liquidity still is very very comfortable but yes, you are right, going forward as credit offtake uh, takes place, as government spending, you know, picks up, because usually government spending picks up from the second quarter onwards, and more so after the monsoon. So as credit offtake picks up, as government expenditure, the pace of government expenditure uh, picks up, and you mentioned the forex intervention also, which the Reserve Bank does from time to time. I think liquidity will come down to sort of, uh, you know, the level of liquidity will come down. But as I have said earlier, we will ensure that there is always adequate liquidity in the system to meet the credit requirements of the economy. So beyond that, I will not be able to say how much liquidity is, uh, you know, we are comfortable with how much liquidity. I will not be able to say. We will ensure that credit offtake is not sacrificed, credit offtake is not affected due to problems of liquidity. So it will depend on how the situation evolves. Thank you, sir. Okay, I think we can conclude. So th thank you very much again. And thank you again, Governor, again, for patiently asking so many questions. That's it.